Our first presentation this, uh, this afternoon is uh, by Alex Norman and Jen Picorni. Alex is a postdoctoral scholar at uh, the Center for Mind and Brain for about a week, has just arrived. He's been a collaborator at the University of uh, Australian Catholic University since last June. And uh, this is his uh, second year um, on this project, but uh, one week into stateside life. Um, he has a PhD in uh, sociology and religious studies, or? Religious studies. Religious studies. Um, and has written a book on spiritual tourism. So um, many of us might fall into the category <laughs> oh. of uh, those he studies. Uh, Jen Picorni is a project. What am I, what am I standing on? All right. um, uh, at the Center for Mind and Brain, in our lab working um, on the Shamana project in multiple capacities. She uh, has a broad background in everything from animal behavior, um, developmental fMRI research, and now learning psychophysiology and qualitative methods, and pushing the envelope of the visualization of meaning in life. Wow. So without further ado, Alex and Jen will present uh, their talk. Thanks, Thank Cliff. You. Uh, so our talk today is um, titled My Life Direction is Changing or Not and what we're looking at are changes over time in goals and priorities. Uh, and our focus, our purpose for today really is to uh, is to examine uh, qualitative interview data to see if there's any change in worldview, approach to life, goals or priorities over a three-month intensive meditation retreat. Uh, and I guess one of the things that we want to do is also try and find a way to capture uh, or to map uh, that change or, or no change as well. So this is part of the Shamatha project, which is a longitudinal study to assess the effects of intensive meditation training. And these were two three-month retreats that took place. They took place at the Shambhala Mountain Center in Colorado. Um, the retreats were led by Ellen Wallace, and the uh, participants were mainly trained in shamatha focused attention meditation, as well as the four measurables. There were two retreats that took place in 2007, the first retreat February through June, and then the second retreat later in the year. There were 30 participants um, in both of these retreats. They were randomly assigned. They were matched on sex, age, meditation experience, other psychological variables. And the participants in retreat two were control participants during retreat one, meaning that they came to Colorado during the different testing time points and were tested alongside of them and then participated in their own retreat later in the year. And we're primarily going to be, or we're only talking about the participants of retreat two today and actually a subset of those six of the 30 individuals we've looked at so far. Um, their age, uh, Five out of the six are above 50 years of age. We had three males, three females, and the subset we're looking at um, highly educated, all college degree or graduate degree, and uh, fairly extensive meditation experience. Um, average lifetime meditation practice hours was over 3,000. Um, so to look at the effects that this intensive training may have for three months, um, they were looking at kind of effects that it may have on cognition, on attention, emotional response and regulation. And so they built and created experimental test facilities at the retreat center so that they could test the participants there. Um, they measured EEG to look at brain responses. They measured changes in um, the physiological body responses and autonomic nervous system, behavioral changes, whether there are biomarker changes. Uh, participants also filled out batteries of questionnaires. They also had, they also kept daily diaries to see what was going on with them. And then also to find out what was going on in the words of the participants themselves, what's going on for them over the course of this three months, um, one of the researchers conducted interviews with the participants. And it's the interviews that are the focus of uh, our work. Uh, our work is qualitative, that is our work together. Uh, and during the retreat, the participants were asked a set of six identical questions th at three time points with two additional questions at the uh, late retreat time point. Uh, they ranged from what it was like to meditate for so many hours every day, 
uh, what the um, uh, experience of being in retreat itself was like, whether they foresaw any transformation or saw any transformation occurring. Uh, their thoughts about the teacher and about the scientific project and our concern today, their approach to life goals uh, and priorities and uh, in late retreat they're asked whether they would thought they would miss the retreat experience um, and whether they foresaw any changes or any problems returning to home life. So our focus uh, in this uh, little project is to look at approach to life goals and priorities and this is uh, the question they're asked. How would you describe or summarise your current perspective on an approach to life including your goals priorities and everyday activities with a follow-up prompt, what's your top, uh, what's most important to you or what's your top priority? Uh, now we conceive of goals and priorities pretty straightforwardly, uh, usually wherever a participant explicitly said or well, one goal I have is or my priorities are uh, or whether they were uh, prompted by the interviewer themselves. However for approach uh, we as researchers conceive, usually people don't say my approach to life is um, so we conceived as approach to life is how one interacts with the world and worldview is how one views the world. And what we tr were wanted to do was find a way to uh, conduct traditional, I guess, qualitative analysis of research data, but find some way to marry that with quantitative methods, uh, particularly as the project itself has so many other quantitative measures. And what we ended up doing was combining uh, qualitative analytical methods with network analysis and graph theory. And basically we wanted a way to take kind of the interviews that are coded and turn them into networks that we could then possibly analyze. Well, this is how we did it. Uh, anyone who's familiar with qualitative analysis will uh, remember from their early grounded theory training that you, uh, the way to get familiar with the data is to open code. Uh, uh, we, and that you also pull out themes that you're interested in as a researcher. We've also added a, a third layer. So we coded in the interviews in three layers, open codes, subject codes, uh, and theme codes. Open codes are in vivo or in the voice of the participant. That's what the person actually said at a particular point in time. Subject codes are us starting to summarise what the participant has been talking about as opposed to what they've said. And the theme codes are researcher and uh, data-driven um, concepts that we apply definition to uh, and that uh, allow us to uh, pull out kind of group trends that are going on. And this is what that process looks like, at, at least at the open code level. Uh, this is a, a transcript. I'll read it out for you because the text is tiny. Uh, so that when, um, uh, that if a chance comes to, uh, to give, to give freely, to, uh, you know, to experience the 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows fully, then, then you, know, um, you know, to try and seek out the heart of the universe. I don't know how else to say it. So, and so when we go into the program, was, was my acting good there? I was, you know. <laughs> uh, this is what it looks like. This is a screen grab from the program we use called Deduce. It's a, an online program for uh, qualitative analysis. And you can see some essentially highlighting there. That's our application of the open codes. And where there is a red highlight, that's deduced telling you that there's more than one code present at that part of the, part of the transcript. So where the participant has said uh, that if a chance comes to give freely, at open code level we've coded that as give freely, in their voice, it's give freely. Where they've said experience the 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows, we've said experience, we've coded it as experience 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows. Now because those two uh, codes and the highlighting of them don't overlap, when we go to network graph these codes, they have a directional relationship. Um, so then a node is created in the, the network for give freely, and a second node is created for experience 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows. And you can see there's a little arrow here, a, a directional arrow pointing from one to the other. When we go forward to uh, where the participant says, try to seek out the heart of the universe, we've open coded that as seek out the heart of the universe. It too does not overlap with the previous code, so it has a directional relationship indicated here by the, by the arrow. However, the red section where the participant says, I don't know how else to say it, so we code it as a failure of language. As the, the, the participant was struggling to come up with a way to, to express what they were talking about. It does overlap with this other section here, so it has a bi-directional relationship with this node. And this is indicated by a bi-directional arrow here between the two nodes in the network graph. 
Now, when we uh, extract this data from deduce, this coding data, uh, run it through a, a script that we've uh, developed ourselves in R, and feed that into Gephi, which is a freeware program, this is what that particular section of transcript looks like, uh, network graphed. You can see the give freely code with the directional arrow. Uh, experience 10,000 joy, sick at the heart of the universe, failure of language with the little bi-directional arrow here and the directional arrows between the others. Jen will explain what the colors mean in a moment. This is the person's whole response to that question. What's your approach to life? What are your goals and priorities? Uh, and you can see just down here is give freely, experience 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows, seek out the heart of the universe, failure of language. And so at the open code level, since this is pretty much still in the, the voice and the words of the participant, you can almost pretty much just read through their entire interview through this network following the arrows. Um, but you'll also see some of the, the nodes and the words are bigger, such as gratitude down there. And so the size of the node corresponds to the number of connections that a particular code will have. Um, as well as the weight of those connections. So if it has that connection more than one time, weight is added each time that those uh, appear either overlapping or have a directional relationship. So the more connections it has, the more the weight that it has of the connections with the nodes around it, it is larger in size. And so you can start seeing some um, codes that may be more important at certain time points. So here, gratitude um, at the early time point. So the colors. Oh, and the colors there, uh, uh, with network analysis, there are a variety of analyses that you can do with them. And this one was pulling out kind of different um, topics, possibly different topics in the network. But it was looking for nodes that are more closely related to one another, so more closely linked. And so the absolute color itself does not matter. And that will vary between the different networks that I show you. But it just kind of creates little clusters and communities of the nodes in the network. And this is the same individual, the same transcript, but this is coded at the subject level. So what they were talking about. So we've started to apply somewhat of our interpretation, but um, getting a way that it's not exactly in the voice and the words of the participants. So we can start making some comparisons across individuals. And so where previously in open code level, we had experienced 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows. Here we have experienced life's ups and downs, because that may be a little bit more generalizable. Um, so they're same, same transcript, just different level of looking at what they're talking about. And here we have the, the theme level um, network that we had coded. Um, same individual early time point. So here kind of the most important themes that were appearing for this individual was family was an important part of their identity. They were seeking balance, kind of a quest for meaning, and also having this sense of gratitude or fulfillment in life, which we also saw kind of early on in that open code network that gratitude appeared to be a, a strong point. This today has been very interesting for us because it's been all about context. Uh, and that's come up in, in every talk. And one of the things that we find fascinating when you produce, especially the subject level graphs, is the way it illustrates context for you. And when you combine all of the uh, graphs of individuals together into one big graph illustrating essentially all of the concerns of those individuals in response to the question, at that point in time you get this uh, beautiful, amazing topography of the structure of their concerns. So when we go in and have a look at the early time point, remember the question is what's your approach to life? What are your goals and priorities? And the past, speaking about the past, leaps off out of the graph to you. That is, they responded to the question by talking about where they had come from, mostly. You can also see here uh, family is a big concern, and they talked about goals, their approach to life. Um, but when we flip forward to the mid-time point, the future, the exact same question asked of the same participants. But here, instead of talking about their background, they talk about what they want to do in the future. This is five weeks difference over a three-month meditation retreat. And the past has dwindled almost into insignificance. You probably can't read it. It's just there. Uh, again, the same themes of family and, uh, uh, and goals and priorities there. And here is on the late time point. The future has reduced in si size a bit. Uh, and the past has increased in size a little bit. Um, but there's a lot more focus on priorities. That probably makes sense coming to the end of a three-month retreat, kind of thinking about what you want to do when you, when you get out, as it were. Now, we wanted to see if there was any change in terms of the content 
of people go people's goals and priorities over the course of the retreat. Um, and uh, when we look, this is the, the theme coding for the group for all six participants. Uh, we can see this emerging picture of wanting to practice meditation, uh, talking about their personal background, the, the theme of a quest for meaning, trying to seek balance. Uh, again, emphasizing the contextual focus of today. These are themes that are apparent in our participants in relation to each other. They don't exist in and of themselves. And this is one of the things that we find very valuable about this network graphing process, is that it allows you to pull out an important theme for a person like um, a quest for meaning and, and see how it relates to other things in their life, like a sense of gratitude, comfort with self and identity, uh, talking about future uh, plans, that kind of thing. When we skip forward to the uh, mid-time point, we see something very interesting. This code of unchanged goals and priorities. That is, they've been in a uh, retreat for five weeks uh, and they have expressed the exact same goals or priorities uh, as they did at the early time point. So no change uh, there, but it does relate to a change in perspective on those goals. Now that might mean, uh, at the theme level, we have a, a, a definition of what change in perspective might, might mean, and that it's that they might have a greater resolve about achieving those goals, that those goals occupy a greater amount of focus, a greater amount of, greater amount of their attention at that point in time. So it's important to recognise that it's not just that the goals haven't changed, it's that they haven't changed, but the, the, how they exist for the individuals has changed. And when we go to the late time point, we see again the unchanged goals and priorities, and here just a little bit of changing perspective on life. Probably it's kept the same from the mid-time point, uh, but again related to some other concerns about seeking balance, uh, that having a top priority, spirituality, death and dying, um, and a bunch of other factors. And now this is the kind of a little table we made up for the content of the goals and priorities. The columns are the time points, the rows are the participants, and yellow highlighting means a consistency of goal or priority. Uh, here we have balancing obligations, balancing obligations, balancing obligations. That means that the participant, uh, we can recall from the data that that participant talked about wanting to balance family life, work life, practice, all together as one. Uh, down here, this participant, a teaching project, teaching project, teaching project. The participant had a, was uh, uh, just about to retire or had just retired and wanted to pursue a project that incorporated her career um, into her future, working with uh, teaching mindfulness, I think, as it was. Now, um, uh, so we have this uh, very interesting consistency across the group. In fact, you can see all six participants had at least one goal or priority stay the same over the course of the retreat. Uh, now, we have to recall that this is what they have told us in the interview. So there's a, there might be a little bit of a difference there between what they actually think and what they told the interviewer at the time. Um, some of the other themes that kind of came out for us when we were looking at the theme level um, of the group of these six participants, um, retirement played a prominent role in this likely context, again, matters, that five of the six participants were all above age 50. Some of them had retired and others were nearing retirement. Um, and we saw that both at the mid time point and the late time point that uh, they were discussing kind of upcoming retirement as well as kind of having this connection to death and dying and that may be discussing their own sort of mortality or wanting to uh, work with individuals who are dying. But that was a, a common theme that mm. the, was the specter up. of death kind of emerged a lot in my retreat. Um, as well as we also started seeing kind of this increased focus of, of practice and wanting to integrate it at home in their daily life once they left. Um, here it's at the bottom in the green kind of increased focus on meditation practice and when they're discussing kind of their future plans. Um, and we also see that, well, the other connection that it has here is personal wealth facilitating practice. Again, five out of the six participants all at some point discussed kind of money and personal wealth um, in relation to pursuing this practice. You know, the fact that they had the stability and not just the stability, but usually more affluent, um, being able to take three months off to participate in this retreat. And when they left, being able to kind of continue to s pursue this practice. And even if they were going to do it at home with home retreats or something, they would still have the flexibility to perhaps not work full time, that they could really focus on continuing their practice. And we see that both at the mid and then here at the late again, um, personal wealth facilitating practice and the development of practice in the context of their home life and wanting to live a contemplative life. 
Um, so kind of in thinking about we didn't necessarily see huge shifts in people's goals and priorities over the course of this three month and, and we didn't really mention um, their approach to life or worldview. One, because we didn't necessarily pick up on it a whole lot. There wasn't enough consistency within one individual over time to see if that was shifting. Also, a shift in worldview would kind of indicate that like a huge conversion may have happened during this period of time. And these are all really experienced meditators and it seems kind of unlikely that even with three months of training, they may not have had this huge shift in their worldview. Um, however, it may also be that this shift would happen later after they leave retreat, once they have to go back out into the world and seeing how they're going to apply their practice after they've been away for three months. Um, so the context does matter, you know, the themes that we're seeing here, that they're highly um, experienced meditators. The fact that we're pulling up a lot of retirement, and perhaps even some of the death dying, has to do with the fact that these participants, this smaller group, the subset here was mainly 50 and above. Um, and, and also t kind of taking into context when these interviews were conducted, this was 2007, kind of pre-global financial crisis. So the fact that so many of them were discussing kind of what they were doing with their upcoming retirement and, and feeling that they had all this kind of freedom and ability to pursue these things. If we conducted these interviews two years later, they may not have been discussing it in quite the same way. They may have lost their retirement or had other stresses going on. Yeah, so context really does matter in terms of interpreting change uh, here, historical context as much as anything else. One of the things that we also want you to take away from, from our talk is uh, just uh, how important we think that the uh, network graph method of doing qualitative analysis is. Uh, because it allows you, and this I think is very unique, it allows you a way to visualise qualitative data. Uh, but as well as that, at the same time, it can allow you to visualize qualitative analysis. And that's quite a cool combination that you can visualize the data and the analysis in one picture. Uh, really, really useful, for, especially for qualitative analysis that struggles. I mean, so often we do qualitative analysis and what you end up with is just a chunk of text. And that's what you're looking at as data. And that's, it's not very pretty, um, even though it has a lot of meaning in it. Uh, here we have a way to, to, I guess, beautify qualitative data. Um, but also in a way that's quite analytical. Another reason that we think this is valuable though is because actually producing the graphs themselves helps with the analytical process, especially at the subject level when you are coding for what participants are talking about. What you end up seeing are groupings of codes, um, communities of codes that you didn't expect at all. And uh, as occurred with us, uh, Th things that we thought were really common actually turned out to be not that common. The graph showed us that it was not that common. So it's a, it's, it's a way for us to visualize data, visualize analysis, and conduct analysis in one. It is maybe a panacea uh, to qualitative <laughs> analysis. I said it out loud, there we go. Um, but finally, uh, especially of interest for us in this project, is that it allows us to be able to extract metrics. Because we've network graphed the coding, we can extract metrics from uh, the graph uh, algorithm, which runs constantly. I should also say, as well as being very beautiful to look at, they are dynamic, the graphs. Here we've kind of presented a picture of it, a snapshot. But in Gephi, the program, the algorithm runs constantly. So the, so the nodes kind of wiggle and jostle for um, superiority with each other all the time. And it's from that uh, constantly running algorithm that we can extract these metrics and perhaps apply to the other measures that we've taken as part of our longitudinal study uh, which is now in its seventh, eighth year. Um, we followed up with participants, asking them the same kinds of questions at five months, at 15 months, uh, and at six, seven years. And so what we find is that it's interesting that the language of cartography has come up a lot today. Um, it's a language that we started using with each other when we began figuring out this method. Uh, that what we were doing was creating maps. That we were, we were mapping the terrain of what participants were telling us about their, their concerns, about their goals, their priorities, their approach to life, their worldview, that kind of thing. And this uh, terrain that we've mapped out here and that we'll continue to map out with the other 24 participants that we have in the project, um, uh, that gives us a picture of the, the, the landscape of their goals and priorities, their worldview and approach as they went through and then exited the three month intensive retreat so that we can follow it and continue to map their progress through the life course at five months, 15 months, and seven years. Uh, but it's important to remember, colleagues, that the map is not the territory. 
And that's also come up a couple of times today too. And that it's very easy, we found this, it was very easy to get in, fall in love with a graph. It looks pretty and it, it can seem like it has the solution to you. That the, 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 the nodes that are biggest are the ones that you should concentrate on. But the map is not the thing that we are studying. We are in fact studying people. And it's important just that we, we keep that in mind. Uh, I, I feel like it's so important, in fact, that I, I scribble that at every desk I work on. I get a little post-it note and scribble it and stick it on my screen just to remind me that I'm not studying the maps that I create, I'm studying the people who created those maps for me. And then last but not least, certainly we would like to thank um, our incredible team, our, our huge team that has helped throughout the years, and of course our fearless leader, Cliff Saren, who, who brought you all here today. And obviously our, our generous funders and sponsors of, as well. Uh, the work would not have been possible without them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, I just want to add, Alex came from the laboratory of Baljinder Sadra, who was on the uh, last slide there. <laughs> Baljinder actually was embedded in the second three-month retreat. And I didn't know if you uh, mentioned. No, she oh, asked. She was the interviewer. She, the, she yeah. conducted all the interviews. So uh, she was sitting with the retreatants um, formally during uh, group sittings, practicing on her own, and uh, being a participant scientist. So it was in that context that these interviews um, were obtained. Um, so. Um, without further ado, are there any questions? So the list, I saw Alyssa's hand first, then you go. Okay. I'll be really quick. Um, congratulations on this beautiful, you know, novel way of looking at meaning and narrative. It's so impressive. So in the Thank Shamata you. project, there was an, a pretty impressive increase in this um, quantitative measure of meaning in life or purpose in life. And since you've been so immersed with these narratives as a whole, can you shed any light on the process of, you know, what does that mean that as a group they've shifted on this scale uh, given this kind of close-up view? Because it's, I mean, it's what we all it, uh, expect, this idea of meaning, but really with all of these themes, get, can you make some meta-themes about that process for people? Uh, yep. I mean, I, I guess what I would say would probably be kind of some, somewhat of that of changing perspective on their goals and priorities, that for some of them, they even explicitly said that they had more resolve about what they were doing. So their actual goal and priority was not, what, not changing. They just, after having you know, been meditating and sitting there and thinking about things, that they were just even more sure that this is what they wanted to be doing and pursuing when they left. So for me, at least in this one question, I would say it's probably that. Yeah, it, it sounds, for us, it, we thought of the same thing, and it sounds similar, and it's something that we're interested in looking at in the future, is seeing if, if the metrics that we can pull out from those nodes in the graphs have a relationship with um, the RIF, I think it's the RIF scale um, mm -hmm. on that. So, uh, what was your interview technique? It's a kind of a That's question from somebody. Uh, the reason I'm asking is that uh, in qualitative research, there is always a co-construction. So how did you neutralize that factor? Uh, the interview, were, there were semi-structured interviews. The, that's the, uh, a summary of the interview schedule just there. Uh, essentially, the, the uh, interviewer would ask the question and let the participant um, answer. Sometimes there were some follow-up prompts. With question six, we gave you the uh, the follow-up prompt. In terms of interpreting uh, the research material, we've just gone with what the participants said. We haven't tried to neutralize uh, the role of the researcher at all. But you see what I'm getting at. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in number six. Yes. Um, it's, uh, do you want to go forward to the actual text of the question? question? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one, and especially when the interviewer prompts for a top priority. Um, which, which in most cases causes the participants to uh, usually re reiterate something that they've said before and possibly place greater emphasis on it. That's an important, it is an important point. I don't know that there's a good way to neutralize it, though. Well, I was thinking about meaning mapping as opposed to this kind of technique, the way uh, we can talk about it more, the way it's done in uh, cultural anthropology and Schweder specifically. Okay. Can be a good alternative. Yeah. So, so like making concept maps of correct. The, 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, just a quick one. Uh, what was the name of the uh, software you used uh, f f for doing the networking? Uh, Gephi. And had, did you try any other software packages? I mean, it would be it would be really interesting to see what different kinds of visualizations you got with different kinds of software packages. Yeah, yeah. We we toyed around with trying R, uh, which has uh, R has some packages that mm -hmm. uh, create network graphs. Um, but we figured for the purposes of this is, I mean, we we completely developed this kind of ourselves. So we just wanted to stick with one and try and figure it out. But we agree with you that other software packages would not only produce different graphs, depending on their algorithmic structures, um, but also um, might help you create, uh, help you analyze the data in a slightly different way. Yeah. yeah, and there are different ways, like different layouts that you can make, different ways that it can create kind of these clusters and, and families, different ways that it can determine kind of what's central. You can choose all different metrics. And so um, to some degree, this was kind of the way that we chose to present it. But there are kind of a great number of ways. I really like networks, so don't take this question the wrong way. But Richie Davidson's not here, so somebody needs to play Richie. And one of the, one of the reasons Richie got into doing all of this brain imaging stuff is coming from a previous life in social psychology and so forth. He developed a deep distrust of self-reporting, going back to the old Nisbet and Wilson paper on telling more than we can know and so forth. And in your work, you are taking literally as true what your informants are telling you when you do these in interviews. And I'm wondering to what extent uh, you're at all concerned that maybe they're, pardon the expression, just giving you a bunch of bullshit to make up in order to answer your questions without actually reflecting what has gone on in their head, life, and uh, whatever at a subconscious level. That, that's uh, certainly a, um, <laughs> yeah. that is a concern, but I, but where, welcome where, where, to, where, welcome to David. <laughs> <laughs> but what, I think one of the things that is, that's important here is that we're analyzing the response that was given. And we wish to contextualize that response uh, in historical, in history, uh, in the context of the science of meditation. I, one of the things that we will talk about in the paper that we're writing uh, about this method and this preliminary um, six participant study uh, is that these participants were part of a large scientific project they'd volunteered for, they'd paid a lot of money uh, to attend. Um, and so that we, we don't seek to divorce their responses to the questions from any of those contextual factors at all. Uh, are they, to use your word, bullshitting? I don't know. That's Richie's word. <laughs> In the context of this room, that was your word. <laughs> and I took it literally. <laughs> if you're going to be trying to, you know, factor in things like the interviewer's style, um, are you doing anything to factor in the teaching style? Because when you say, you know, one of the things you're seeing is increased resolve, my first thought is, Alan's teaching, of course there's increased resolve. I don't know if this is relevant, or, or is there any way to do a comparison with yeah. other teaching styles? Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 we've talked about this before, actually, that, that there is a... The, the jargon? There is, there, is a, yeah, there is a language, there is a lexicon that the group adopts over time. Absolutely, yeah. By the end of the re retreat, the, the, the word games that are played uh, is, is something that's quite noticeable, absolutely. And that, that's, a, that's a function of the teacher, for sure, yeah. But also being together as a group of 30 in a beautiful location, together intensively, in, intensively together, part of a, essentially a ritual cohort for, for three months. Um, and we would, like, as a, as a sociologist, I would expect a ritual cohort like that to kind of come together in all sorts of ways in terms of goals and priorities and stuff. And we didn't see any change in goals and priorities, which was genuinely a surprise to us. Um, but we did see their language change. And yeah, that, that resolve is something that um, we picked up on as well, uh, as something probably coming out of uh, the language that the teacher used. And, and we've thought of maybe coding things in different ways. So another a common phrase that also comes up is to be of service. Mm. Um, 
and to be of service in itself, is that, is that a goal? Is that a specific goal? Can, how do you do that? And some people actually talk about actions that they're going to do and carry that out, whereas others may just keep saying over and over to be of service. Mm. Um, and to some degree, that may kind of carry different meaning and weight for people. And so we've we thought about kind of coding those in slightly different ways. If they're just kind of saying some of the jargon and phrases parroting back versus really integrating it into their lives and having a plan for what they're going to do. And it, and it, but again, with the kind of foot, <clears throat> footnote or caveat that it's only what they gave in the context of the response that a person might say they wanted to, for example, to be of service, and just then not talked about any of the things that they had in mind of how that could take place. So we're, we're quite conscious of the fact that somebody just might not have been in a talkative mood that day. Um, they might have. But one of the things that does co actually actively come up a lot in the research is that the interviews took place at the same time as roughly the same time as the other testing, and many of them talk about how difficult the testing was and what a toll it took on them uh, personally. Uh, and so they might have just had a crap day uh, <laughs> and not feel like talking to this person sitting in front of them, kind of asking them questions about who are you, why are you here, that kind of stuff. Last question. Uh, it's really sort of a follow-up. Have you t looked at the the uh, transcripts of the teachings and just look for a frequency of terms? Just curious. Um, so we we do have the recordings of the teachings and and have kind of gone through, listened to some of them, and kind of written down the the topics and what was being taught with all of those teachings. We have not gone necessarily at this point to the level of transcribing them and doing the analysis on the teachings as well. But that is something that we've also discussed of right. kind of looking at. I wonder if that yeah. you could even or you might be able to automate some of that capture of the transcript actually. Right, if we're just pulling and out certain terms yeah. and phrases, we, we would be able to do that. Right, yeah, because yeah. I wonder whether, just to follow up, whether you'll find that mm -hmm. certain terms are actually said a lot and therefore they appear a lot in your, uh, in your study. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, tell it, me why, I'm just curious, why did you expect there to be a change in life goals and what's your hypothesis about why there isn't one? Our, our expectation was because uh, the, the group had entered, a, uh, I guess it's a somewhat naive hypothesis, um, that the group had entered into the retreat uh, setting with uh, this very charismatic teacher um, with uh, a specific uh, set of kind of terms and, and language that was used, especially about this, uh, thing, this idea of uh, service to others, um, uh, aspiration, uh, positive aspiration, stuff like that. Uh, and so our kind of working hypothesis was that we would see some change in goals. But what we failed to take into account, I think, when we were doing that was the age, the average age of the six here. For the, for the rest of the retreat cohort, there are um, a number of other people who are not over 50. And we wouldn't really expect people who are over 50 uh, or over 60 to have a, a, a radical change in goal or priority. But we might expect people who are mid-20s to have changes. And, and so that's where we're interested to see the rest of the data. Um, and analyze that and sit, like, see if there's a, a relationship to age there. Yeah, it's certainly true that we had 15% of the participants enter into long-term retreat, that is on the order of five to six years after the project. So the project was over in terms of our initial data collection, but they then set about creating the conditions in their life to stay in retreat. And I don't believe that they intended to do that when they came. Mm. So that would be probably a shift. Thank you very much. We're going to move on.